What I found in this work is combining the factual and the data with the emotion that sits in storytelling being incredibly impactful. Um, so every strategy that we build, every conversation that we support, we're seeking to bring those things together and find multiple entry points for, for others to find value in this work. Hi, I'm Shannon Lucas. I'm one of the co-CEOs of Catalyst Constellations, which is dedicated to catalyzing innate change makers to accelerate positive change. And I'm Justin Scott Campbell. I am a DEI consultant and leadership executive coach. This is our podcast, Catalyzing, Catalyzing a, a Culture of inclusion. of inclusion, where we highlight catalysts who have taken the brave step of moving into DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion work, leadership in large organizations. We hope this mini series is a space of learning, encouragement, and ultimately community and connection. If you're new to DEI and or the world of Catalyst, we hope you'll enjoy. I am so thrilled today to be able to catch up with the amazing Lauren Guthrie. She is the Vice President of Global Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Action idea uh, at VF Corp and the talent development uh, leader as well for VFC. She also, fun fact, sponsored the first all black expedition to attempt climbing Mount Everest and they were successful and have gone on to do amazing things. It's so lovely to have you here today, Lauren. Thanks for joining us. Oh my gosh, thanks for having this forum first, first of all, and for inviting me. I'm excited about it. Us too. Well, let's dig in. Let's, let's, let's start. So how do you sort of um, think about yourself in the role of a DEI leader and the concept of a catalyst? Yeah, so I am fortunate to have discovered this work. Um, it's something late in career that I had the opportunity to move into. Um, and I say move into um, very intentionally because I think oftentimes catalysts are parts of movements or initiators of movements. And I certainly um, was very much swept up in the movement and the, or the movements that happened um, as a result of all of the events of 2020. Um, found myself as a working mom uh, who was really struggling to support my daughter in virtual school, uh, raised my three-year-old son um, as a Black man in this country without, um, without fear and with the courage necessary to lean in, um, and really honestly found myself not capable of showing up to work um, at that time, performing a very different job um, with the focus and the tenacity. And, and I recognized that there were probably many others who shared that. Um, so for me, my origins in this work are very much of, as a catalyst, um, speaking up for my personal experience, um, acknowledging um, and calling attention to the fact that, that this wasn't a time for business as usual, um, and asking my organization to do better. Um, what started as a personal plea to one person became a personal plea to an organization of 35,000 people uh, globally and, um, you know, provided me with the opportunity to create space uh, for others to share their thoughts, their concerns, um, and ultimately kind of collectively breathe breathe together as an organization in a time of healing. Um, for me, that's the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion is recognizing those needs. Um, they may be unique needs. They may be needs that are specific to a very small subset of a population, um, but it doesn't invalidate the opportunity to use those moments to catalyze allyship in advocacy within an organization to create really intentional connectivity to moments socially within the corporate setting um, to promote healing within the corporate setting um, and ultimately to use all of the emotion that comes from those authentic um, connections to drive process evolution. Um, and so that's the work that I was invited into initially um, standing up and leading our council to advance racial equity, which is a first for VF to use that term equity very intentionally, um, but to create um, you know, with a subset of my peers, a set of guiding principles to guide us towards an anti-racist culture uh, through deliberate action. And so, um, you know, it became a holistic voice uh, of those who found themselves in similar positions who were able to advocate. And I think the role of a catalyst is not what you can push alone, but that where you can create spaces uh, for others to lean in. Um, and I think in this work, how you can create bridges to common understanding. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that, uh, Lauren. I love the connection between uh, this work and your personal life. And I think for many of us in this work, it's not just work. It's also deeply 
personal. Uh, you know, I think of my own two sons uh, as well when you talked about, you know, raising your kids and, and how this is not just work for now, but for the future um, mm -hmm. and for future generations even. And so as you were scaling and moving from the, the personal work of, of doing this and being, you know, and seeing this happening in the world and scaling it to the organization, uh, are there what are one to two essential skills that have been successful for you as a catalyst leader um, and maybe some stories um, that kind of exemplify those skills in action yeah absolutely i mean i think the work of of dei interestingly requires um always do multiplicity of strategy <laughs> there isn't one angle that you can pull on that will allow you to be successful and i think you know to be effective in in this work and certainly to be effective as a catalyst you need to be really thoughtful about your audience um and what i found in this work is combining the factual and the data with the emotion that sits in storytelling being incredibly impactful. Um, so every strategy that we build, every conversation that we support, we're seeking to bring those things together and find multiple entry points for, for others to find value in this work. Um, that could be as simple as how we present a presentation. Um, it also can be as complex as ensuring that we're supporting um, multiple diversity dimensions mentions in every um, activation that we have, um, you know, race and ethnicity, particularly in the U.S., but in several countries around the globe, has been a really focal challenge from a social justice perspective um, forever, but certainly reamplified within the past couple of years. Um, that's not the easiest entry point for folks to understand some of the core tenets necessary um, to unpack in order to show up effectively in the work. Um, so that doesn't diminish our desire or need to drive focal points, but it does create opportunity or need um, to drive balance. And so we're always thinking about how we can pull people into the work, whether that's from an accessibility perspective or a gender identity perspective, or even, um, you know, we have, I have the benefit of supporting consumer brands. Um, so thinking through the full diversity of our consumers and tying it back to business business initiatives um, in a way that's really hyper relevant for our leaders and our associates creates another um, another connection point. So I would say finding, you know, planting many seeds and harvesting them <laughs> is such a critical way of creating meaningful, um, I would say ambassadorship in this work, but even more important, importantly, um, a very unique and personal connection to the core tenants of DEI. Um, so I would say for a catalyst, being really thoughtful about who your stakeholders are, who your dissenters are, um, who your advocates are, and finding not singular ways, but multiple ways to engage um, both, you know, those who are leading, but also those who are lagging is critically important to the pace and rate and the effectiveness and sustainability of change. Um, and I think we're always thinking uh, very strategically about that. It's also a place where I've had a ton of learnings um, and I've had to develop some thick skin um, as someone who likes to be liked. I'm sure many can relate to that. Um, it's impossible in this work to universally support everyone where they are in their journeys, where they are in their advocacy and, and, and where they are in their beliefs. Um, and you know, whenever we're taking a stand or a position uh, on a certain set of issues, we run the risk of, of alienating someone at the level of identity. Um, so having the conviction to, um, to, to move forward with what you think is right, um, recognizing that not everyone uh, will agree um, or have the same perspective is, is a huge skill, I think, that can be honed and cultivated. I hope as an empath, I never am perfect at that, uh, but it certainly, you know, is, is a, a key part of, you know, what I ask myself and my team uh, to step into um, in order to, to ensure that we're moving our entire organization forward. So um, be mindful of, of where there are challenges, but certainly um, if we only, if we, if we only addressed, um, you know, where there's stickiness, we'll never have the power, the fortitude, the courage to keep moving forward. Yeah, I, I think about resistance, you know, as a, as a kind of natural response to change. And so um, as you kind of move through these different stages, what are some of the ways um, 
in which you know you've gotten the support you need to drive this level of system change yeah um there are I'm fortunate to have many examples um, of support. I would say at an organizational level for DEI to be successful, you have to have the support um, first and foremost of your, your most senior leader. Um, in my case, it was our chief executive officer, um, our CHRO, our chief human resources officer and our executive leadership team. And I would say executive leadership team to various varying degrees. I think that's normal, but to have those two senior leaders committed to the concept of the work, uh, first and foremost, um, what we were able to build was a belief system um, in, the, in, in the power of change and connect that change back to the business in multiple ways. Um, so certainly from an associate experience perspective, we recognize that the concept of belonging, the power of inclusion unlocks our associate base. We recognize that there was need for our um, employee population to better reflect the full diversity of our consumer base. Um, and so by tightening that connection and creating more intentional um, representation, um, we knew that we would be more effective as a business and there's a source of competitive advantage there. Um, and then certainly as an organization that seeks to do good, you know, we leverage our DEI platform to support the power of community as well, both community building internally, but also connecting um, to, to the communities in which we live and work as key advocates. Um, so for me, by really balancing that platform, we were able to secure um, increased investment and resource to build uh, strategic platforms that would catalyze each one of those pillars, associate experience, consumer experience, and community engagement. Um, and so finding ways to activate our associate population in each one of those ways. Um, we've seen incredible advocacy bottoms up from our associates who recognize um, that there's an opportunity for them to show up in support of their values each and every each and every day. And one of the ways to do that is through the concept of idea um, or inclusion, diversity, and equity. Uh, we've also seen a huge groundswell of support from our functional leaders who recognize this is a way to catalyze their business, to connect with new consumer segments, or to acknowledge consumer segments that perhaps perhaps we haven't been as, as visibly supportive of in, our, in some of our brand's histories um, and write that shit. And then an opportunity to really live behind our values by creating impact in our in communities. And so it's been really interesting to see the dynamic between what we drive top down in terms of strategic imperatives and the richness that has come from our associate base um, in support of the tactical on the ground, you know, everyday measures. Um, whether that's, you know, an ERG activation or an employee resource group event just to hold community or whether that's a volunteerism strategy um, or, or, you know, some of the collaborations that we're driving um, or new artists or new collaborators that we're bringing into our brand. So um, a ton of support, I would say, in a really grassroots way, but um, that accountability by uh, our willingness to proclaim externally commitments uh, our willingness to provide transparency to our progress or lack thereof um, is an important part of that kind of reinforcing commitment from our from our organization to stand behind the concept of idea. But the beauty of the A um, is that it stands for action. Um, and so we want to make sure that that commitment is felt beyond the rhetoric and is felt tangibly uh, in the fabric of the business. Yeah, and even and as I think about that, what do you have any stories of connection or community that stand out to you in terms of maybe folks' experiences um, and how you know the the structures that you're building have real time impact on people's lives and uh, experiences where they work and and even maybe even extending into where when they go home or you know but are there any kind of tangible or case studies examples that that stand out to you? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the key outputs of our Council to Advance Racial Equity was a commitment to support um, education, particularly in areas of our business that have not historically attracted 
uh, underrepresented populations. So design, for example, as a, as a discipline across industries has an extraordinarily low representation of people of color. Um, so this is an example of kind of how we would pull our strategy through all of those audiences. We recognized, um, you know, we wanted to improve the level um, of representation within design, but we didn't want to do so in a way that was only serving um, us as an organization, we recognize that there was opportunity to really support the root cause of the of the problem. Um, and so we worked with an external organization called Pencil. They're now Pencil Lewis College of Business and Design, the first design oriented HBCU. So really proud of their growth. Um, but to essentially to, to build a masterclass program that would provide free design education um, to students who showed a passion um, and just a really foundational talent for sketching. Um, and then called that group down to um, a smaller group of 16 students who we invited to participate in master classes with our design leadership. So they got exposure to our brands, they got to work on real consumer issues. Um, and this is actually in the footwear design space, which you could liken to industrial design, right? So historically thought to be highly, highly skilled people go to school for years and years to develop the expertise. Um, and through this partnership, we're able to short circuit the learning experience by really anchoring um, these incredibly passionate and talented kids um, in real life opportunities to grow their skills. And then ultimately we invited um, five participants to join us for a full year apprenticeship program with four of our footwear brands. Um, so they spent time with Timberland Vans, the North Face and Ultra. Um, and, and this is where the real lifeness of it comes to comes to a head. I mean, we materially changed all five of their lives. Um, none of them believed that they could have a career in footwear design or even knew it was a possibility for them to earn a lucrative, powerful living, uh, living their passion in footwear design. But even more importantly, they changed our culture, their courage, their tenacity, their belief, um, their discipline, their work ethic. Um, I can honestly say that anyone who engaged with any one of the five participants um, grew a level of belief in what could be possible that they certainly would not have had if, if and, and I don't credit the program, I credit our ability to find these individuals through the program. Um, and so what I can honestly say is we went on to hire four, four are now in full-time roles with our brands. The fifth um, wanted to finish his college degree, which I absolutely cannot fault him for, uh, but he's joining us again this summer for another apprenticeship. And so we're proud of our ability to provide impact at scale, impact materially to our business. Um, those are four designers that we would not have found any other way, but hopefully a whole class of designers who will find their place in industry. Um, but to your point, um, you know, our lives changed also. Our belief system and how we recruit talent our thoughtfulness around what truly prerequisites are for a career in a highly technical space have been changed that transcends design. Um, and so we're leveraging apprenticeships now as a really key vehicle uh, to, to create new potential, both in the business, but also for individuals who are doing the same with our retail organization currently as a way to create more advancement opportunities for our most passionate associates who are serving in our stores, who are seeking opportunities to influence greater strategy through corporate roles. So super proud of what we've been able to do with Pencil. We're looking to build and scale it. Um, but it's a way in which, you know, you you can feel lives being altered in a really tangible mm. way. Um, but I think the critical component is not just the participants, right? VF is forever changed from having had four individuals join our organization. So it's such a powerful example because, um, you know, so many leaders, one of the things that you hear at the leadership level often is, well, there just isn't the pipeline, Right. right? And I love, and, and you hit on it at the end, it's like, it's a systems approach, a priori, right. that then materially impacted your pipeline of candidates. And that impact had all of the positive impacts that we know that having a diverse employee base brings to an organization. Right. So like up and down the systems, the people, the, 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 the participants of the program, the internal people, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful example. Yeah. yeah. 
No, thank you for that. And I think that is the power of this work when done well. If it is just focused inward, we're missing a huge That's right of the impact of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and for us, that was the, the meat of adding the term equity to our strategic focus is the commitment to impact systems, um, not just in a way that improves our outcomes, but improves outcomes broadly. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the beauty of this work. It's also the difficulty of this work. Many <laughs> of the systems we're seeking to combat are you know, steeped in hundreds of years of um of stuff <laughs> yeah it's a different word right um and so we're we can swear on our side it's okay, okay. the book has okay. a swear word in it it's all good lauren <laughs> right you could just bleep me out um, but um but but i think that's the opportunity for organizations this day and age and you know one of the reasons i'm so proud to work for bf is that we desire to inspire movements. That's part of our purpose statement. Mm. We power movements of sustainable and active lifestyles for the betterment of people and planet. And I think all organizations have the obligation of inspiring movements that can start internally, but ultimately, you know, whoever you are transacting with externally um, also should benefit from those movements. And that's where I think the power of our framework, you know, associate consumer and community is, is really rich. It's also right. really challenging. Yeah. And I think it's a really interesting call to action because as I was listening to you talk, I'm like, oh, how do we scale that? Well, if every company picked their thing yeah. <laughs> to, to do that way, then it's it's an unlimited pipeline of change. All right. But I, so congratulations. It's awesome. I hope more people lean into doing similar things. What are the biggest challenges for you as a catalyst leader leading DEI work? Yeah, um, that is the question. <laughs> Um, I'll say first and foremost, the challenge is rate of change um, so that it's sustainable. And, um, you know, I've had a steep learning curve in this job. I've now sat in the seat for um, almost three years. And, um, you know, as, as we discussed prior, I don't think there's any singular right answer that's going to be a silver bullet in this work. If there was, someone would have found it by now. Um, but figuring out the right rate of change that is sustainable is incredibly difficult. And we've certainly had some missteps there, places where we made commitments um, where we haven't fortified our organization to understand the issue areas that we were stepping into or understand why we felt like it was a relevant area of advocacy for VF. And we've lost people along the way um, that, that really eroded the impact of those efforts. Conversely, you can certainly move too slow, <laughs> right? Uh, where you know people aren't feeling in their everyday experience the reality of the rhetoric that we're articulating in a senior leadership level. Um, and so I like to say it's inside out and outside in work. It's, you know, bottom bottoms up and top down. It's everywhere. Um, and we know that there's great uniqueness in organizational readiness, leader readiness, and individual associate readiness. Um, and so part of that, you know, is the set is maybe the second answer I'd give to that question, which is just truly, it's emotional work. If it's not emotional work, you're doing something wrong. That's right. Talking about fundamental humanity, um, you know, and to the point made before, you can't get it right for everyone. And so the ability to stand um, with conviction, the ability to, to admit when you're wrong and course correct and shift, um, and, and certainly the willingness to, to lean in with those who are unlike you, to, to lean into the areas of greatest opposition, still with, um, with courage and with sensitivity um, and recognizing that all perspectives are valuable, even if they're not your own, um, can be really challenging. But I can say I'm forever changed. As someone who, um, you know, has been through a yoga teacher training, nothing has made that work real than doing DEI. Um, the ability to breathe, the ability to lean in, the ability to operate without a sense of expectation, but really meet people where they are, be present, and be able to scale that at, at an organizational level has been certainly a challenge and we're continuing to find in real time in every issue area the right balance of those things how do you i mean and this is part of the reason why we do the the podcast is because you know the recognition for me that i don't think there's a job maybe doctors i don't know but like there's not a job on earth that has like the emotional 
uh, labor that you do, or it's up there. How do you sustain your energy in all of that? Yeah, belief. Um, and I think that's, that's part of, you know, being a catalyst, right, is the belief in the end state that you're pushing toward. And, um, you know, for me, I, I had an entire career doing something different. And what was missing was that connection to values. What sustains me in this work is recognizing that I'm showing up in service of my own values. And, and as you mentioned before, um, you know, showing up in service of, of the future for my children, for my friends, for my family, for for humans that I care so deeply about. Um, and so I think it's the caring that sustains me and knowing that in this work, I'm not just affecting, you know, again, the 35,000 associates with NVF, but that we position this role to create meaningful impact in society. And um, we're chipping away at that. So I celebrate every win. Um, you know, I try to reframe every loss. You know, there's a gift in, in it all, right? Into the, the learnings that are going to help the propel us forward, but it's honestly the belief that this work matters and that we can experience change um, that is going to benefit all of humanity. That is the foundation of, of everything that I do. That's a good driver. That's a good, that makes you wake up in the morning and be like, okay, one more day. Here we go. All right. Thank you. I'm going to hit it back to Justin for the rapid fire questions. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very powerful why, um, and I and I think it's a, a sustainable one, as you said that 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 fuels into the future uh, in a deep way. So thank you for sharing that. I resonate with that a lot. And so as we do a rapid fire, we just like to get to know our our catalyst DEI leaders a little bit better. Um, and so the first question is, uh, what's one thing you do to be ready for a big meeting? Yeah, can I give you two? <laughs> yes. All right, yeah. the first two is, two is great. <laughs> the first is be ready. Um, you know, I have a foundational element of be excellent. So be ready, do the work. Um, the second piece is I, um, I find some part of my body where I'm holding tension and I push the breath there and that becomes my focus area. Um, whenever I'm, I'm presenting in a meeting. So whether that's fingers together, whether that's just breathing into spaces in my shoulders, I try to use the power of breath to keep me open. Great, thank you. Uh, the second one is, uh, what's one, your favorite way to spend a free day? <laughs> um, as mentioned, I'm obsessed with all things connection. Um, I should say my favorite way to, to spend a free day is with my children, but it's with my furry child. Um, I have a two-year-old horse and I grew up horseback riding. Um, and for me, that that is presence, to be in the moment with another being, experiencing things together, because these two, there's a lot of first experiences. Um, and so I just, I absolutely love being in the barn environment with my favorite furry being. And my kids too, they're awesome. And the name, the name, your horse's name, sorry. Yeah, is Quill or Quilliam. Yeah. yeah. I didn't name him. That's the name he came with, but it suits him. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, last one is your favorite famous catalyst, alive or dead, and why? Yeah. Um, this was a super easy question for me. It's 100% my father. Um, he is my management mentor in all ways. Um, and I think the way in which he's shown up as a catalyst has paved the way for my own brand of catalysm. Is that a word? Um, <laughs> catalysis. Uh, but again, it's through, you know, authentic connection with others. And he's a kind of person who can find, um, a relationship with a stick. Um, but he uses, the power of relationship to motivate, to coach, to inspire, and has, you know, built um, an incredible business from, from nothing a few times over in his career. And so for me, watching him and the power of his leadership, how he brings everyone along, leaves no one behind, has definitely served as the platform for how I aspire to show up as a leader. That's great. Thank you. Um, and as you think about this work in general, are there any kind of uh, calls to action? Have you talked about this being a, a work of action? Is there any calls to action that you'd like to share with our listeners or invite us into? Yeah, I think um, 
you know, certainly the power of DEI and I think, you know, the, the fuel that powers the concept of catalyst is very similar. And it requires all of us to leverage a source of strength, which to me is also a source of privilege and put it to work for something bigger than ourselves. And so for me, the call to action is I think we all have elements that we can use to power movements in that way, even if it's a movement in a family structure, a movement in community, certainly movement organizationally, but to find that thing that you have that's a gift, that it's a privilege for you to hone and build and share um, and find a way to, to power a movement with it. And for me, you know, outside of DEI, um, you know, that's been through my, my relationships uh, with folks that's been through coaching. I think the most impactful way it shows up and how I choose to parent. Um, but I think we all have ways to create ripple effects. Um, parenting serves us over generations. Um, and so hope that, hope that everyone will find that thing uh, that they can drive from a source of privilege or strength. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. Um, and Lauren, it's been great to hear about your work. Uh, thank you for sharing it with us. Uh, I know I'm excited. I know we're both excited to see uh, what those seeds that you are planting uh, will continue to grow into over the years and the decades. And uh, as as we like to say, we're, we're planting seeds for trees we will never sit under. And so um, that is an essential part of creating shade for future generations. And so thank you for the work that you're doing um, on this large scale for, for that purpose. Um, and so thank you for those of you who are listening. Um, if you'd like to learn more about how to accelerate positive change, go to our website at catalystconstellations.com. And of course, be sure to check out our book, Move Fast, Break, Shit, Burn Out. If you have other catalysts in your life, hit the share button and send the link their way. <laughs>